Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm very happy that you have decided to uh, watch this very exciting uh, event that we are hosting here at the International Institute for Peace. I'm Angela Kane, and I am the uh, Vice President of the International Institute for Peace, and have been so for the last five years, actually. And uh, we have um, today, we have two very good experts with us, and we will discuss a very important subject. But before we, uh, I introduce the experts, let me just say a couple of ground rules. I would like to encourage you to uh, ask your questions in the, um, in the question and answer box, and uh, I will select them and uh, post them to the experts. If they're addressed to a specific expert, then please also indicate that that would be helpful. And uh, I think that uh, we will take it from there. We have about 90 minutes for this webinar, and I look forward to uh, engaging not only from hearing from the experts, but also to hear from you about your views and your commentary. Now, each of the experts will speak about 10 to 15 minutes, and we will open it then up for questions. Now, as you know, November starts with All Souls Day, and it's really a month of remembering the loved ones we have lost, of honoring them by putting flowers on their graves, by thinking about them, and also by talking about them. And this is also an opportunity for looking at the nature of remembrance. You know, what does remembrance mean for all of us? We are now 75 years after the liberation of Auschwitz, after the end of the Second World War. And so the question that we ask ourselves is, what is the obligation of current generations to memorial sites that are very important? But what is the obligation of the current situation many years after an event happened? And how does Auschwitz and other memorial sites fare in terms of COVID-19, which we are already grappling with for the last eight months? Now, the two experts who are here to discuss the issue of remembrance and particularly also Auschwitz is, first of all, uh, Dr. Wojciech Sochewica, and he's the Director General of the Auschwitz-Birkenau Foundation. And he is a graduate of the Institute of International Relations at the Institute in University of Warsaw and the Diplomatic Academy of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Poland. And he first worked at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, then in the office of Vladislav Batyshevsky, the plenipotentiary for international dialogue at the Prime Minister's Chancellery. And in 2013-15, he was director of the International Corporation in the office of the Polish Commissioner for Human Rights. <clears throat> and since 2015, he was the deputy director for international cooperation at the Warsaw City Hall. And he took over this important post as director general of the Auschwitz-Birkenau Foundation uh, in January 2019. So I'm going to turn over first to, uh, to you, Wojtek, before introducing also our second uh, panelist uh, in a minute. Thank you very much. Wojtek, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you, An Angela. And uh, I would like to stress out that I'm very thankful to the uh, Institute, uh, uh, the International Institute for Peace. We have been working on this uh, event for a couple of months now. And uh, like in so many other cases, in so many other places in the world, Corona has made it very difficult for us. So I am even more uh, thankful that uh, finally we managed to do this in, in this format. Um, I'm also very thankful to, to Eva that she, she uh, decided to join and to be with us. And I'm looking forward um, to, to discussing with both of you this important topic. Now, um, 2020, you already mentioned it, Angela, uh, was supposed to be very significant because this is the 75th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz. And, uh, we at the foundation and also at the memorial were making ready uh, to use this framework uh, because on January 27th this year, uh, we had over 200 survivors present at Oświęcim on the site uh, of the former Kyle Auschwitz who were there with us and we were there with them to commemorate the 75th anniversary of the liberation. Uh, together with them, there were also more than 55 uh, heads of government and state with their delegations, also to, to pay their respects to, to the victims and the survivors alike. And for us, this, was, uh, uh, this year was supposed to be very significant because uh, uh, in the, in the, as a consequence, we wanted to work with international governments to make sure that the preservation of Auschwitz-Birkenau will be uh, safeguarded. Um, the foundation, the Auschwitz-Birkenau Foundation was... Um, established more than 10 years ago by Professor Wodysław Bartoszewski, whom you already mentioned. He was himself an Auschwitz survivor. He was Secretary of State in Prime Minister Donald Tusk's government. And uh, he was uh, the one who made the decision to establish the foundation. 
Um, and uh, this was, as I said, more than 10 years ago, because we back then reached a moment in history when uh, it was very clear that the financial burden of preserving Auschwitz-Birkenau was too big to be taken care of by the Polish government only, which had done the job for 65 years uh, with regards to Auschwitz, but also all the other concentration and extermination camps um, on today's Poland's territory. And um, there were, of course, uh, exceptions with, which were project-based. So you can imagine that other barracks or personal items of former prisoners were taken care of by, uh, um, by the European Union, for example, um, by other governments. Uh, Germany was contributing a lot. Austria was contributing, the, the Netherlands throughout the years. But the main burden was on the Polish, on the Polish government. And it became very clear that 75 years into peaceful Europe, the costs of preserving 155 structures, uh, 300 ruins, thousands of kilometers of roads and fences, um, hundreds of thousands of personal items. And we're talking about shoes, we're talking about dresses, uh, toothbrushes, of course, and lots and lots of other personal items, documents that need to be preserved because all of them are uh, witnesses to this terrible crime of the Shoah, uh, and they need to be preserved. Now, this means that um, uh, the team of conservators, which is working on the site, there is more than 30 professional conservators working on a daily basis at Auschwitz-Birkenau. They are very often dealing with uh, an area that is, um, to us, uh, well, they are doing a very innovative work. That's what I'm trying to say. Um, you have to understand that in many cases they are dealing with materials that we as people living in the third de decade of the 21st century regard as uh, not valuable, for example, plastic. Now, when you look at toothbrushes made of plastic that used to belong to prisoners of Auschwitz-Birkenau, and plastic tends to fall apart naturally, uh, these are not objects or items that we can replace. We can throw them away. We have to preserve every single item. And it turns out that there is not many places in the world that do professional preservation work with plastic or other objects and other materials. But this is very often a good example to, to, uh, to show what we are talking about. And uh, 10 years ago, when the decision was made to build this, uh, this foundation and a large uh, endowment with a purpose to amass 176 million euro, which is invested safely and from the uh, interests uh, the preservation process at Auschwitz-Birkenau is being financed. When the decision was made, we reached out to many, many international governments uh, at national level, also cities uh, and private donors, of course, because we understood that uh, since Poland had joined the European Union, became member of NATO, uh, became a member of the Western um, alliances, it was very clear that uh, we have now a... Um, a good ground to reach out to our Western partners and try to build a really global responsibility. And as a consequence, uh, today the foundation is honored to be partnering with 39 govern governments from all over the world, from you know, Asia, the Australia's, uh, the, both Americas and Europe. Uh, we have uh, a large network of private donors, uh, from mainly from the United States and Canada, uh, we have uh, two major cities, uh, Paris and London, who are also partners to the foundation. And um, they all have uh, partnered in this, in this large effort to uh, not only to provide us with, with the funds, but also to assist us with um, technical issues, how to invest money safely. And the foundation is really privileged to be in a position today to um, be able to safeguard the most valuable um, physical material witnesses of the Shoah 75 years um, after World War II, um, not only because we have the financial means, we are not fully there, but we hope that soon we'll be able to announce to the world that the preservation is financially safeguarded, uh, but, uh, but also to have the ability to work with experts in, in, in finance, in preservation, um, in, in uh, accounting, all these uh, minor, very often technical issues, which are not, uh, not so important when you look at it from, from the outside, but without your expertise, we would not be able to do 
to do our work. And we, we are convinced that this is, this is extremely important. So uh, 10 years into the process, 11 years into the process, uh, the, the foundation um, has been able to support the mission of the museum, the Auschwitz Museum, the Auschwitz Memorial. And uh, when we are very optimistic to look into the future, even though COVID-19 has made things much more difficult, but everyone who, who has joined today knows what, what I mean. We, we are limited to working from our offices. We can't travel. We can't uh, talk about uh, what has been achieved, how many brick barracks have been preserved, uh, and what is at stake. So this is, uh, this is a large, uh, a large uh, challenge for us. Now, um, what is important is that um, in 2019, uh, the memorial was... Uh, officially giving back to the public the first two brick barracks that have been fully preserved from the, from the means of the foundation. Um, we have uh, in total a, uh, a number of around 45 brick barracks at Birkenau that need preservation. And these buildings have not been constructed, as all of you know, to last for 75 years. They were serving a very specific purpose and uh, uh, this purpose was not counted to last for so, so, so many years. So these buildings were, um, in most cases, built by prisoners, uh, so not professionals in construction. They are, uh, in most cases, only a uh, brick stone thick, which means that it's around 12 centimeters, with very difficult conditions on the site. And I mean, uh, I mean the weather conditions... Uh, uh, it's, uh, we have very shallow groundwaters in Birkenau. Uh, it's a muddy area. If you have buildings that are not professionally built with very shallow foundations, with, uh, as I mentioned, very thin walls, these buildings tend to move. And the roof turns out to be too heavy and can be carried by the walls. So very specific work is necessary to look into ways how to safeguard what is there and what needs to be safeguarded in an authentic way. And this is the key word. Uh, Auschwitz-Birkenau is preserving authenticity. Uh, whenever it's not necessary, nothing is being replaced, right? So we are providing the visitors who come to the site with the opportunity to see and experience how the camp could have looked in 1945 after its uh, liberation. Uh, and in most cases, we are successful, or the team of uh, conservators are successful. So a visitor, whenever he or she enters uh, a, a brick barrack or a wooden barrack, is not supposed to see any intervention that is, uh, that is from today or is modern. And, and that's the way we want to present history. And that's also the way uh, survivors who have been assisting us throughout those 11 years have stressed the necessity to show history and show what has actually actually happened uh, and there um, this place needs to be preserved as it was and it needs to remain authentic um, i think I, I i gave a very brief um, introduction to the the topics of, of preservation perhaps i could sh make a break and and uh, allow eva now to to say a couple of words and then we might come back um, Thank you very much, Wojtek. This was fascinating because I think none of us realizes the extent of the work that needs to be done. I mean, when you talk about 155 structures, 300 ruins, roads, um, hundreds of thousands of personal items that need to be preserved, and I liked you know, your reference also to the plastic, which again is something that one doesn't really think about. And um, so the magnitude of this work and the authenticity that you're trying to preserve is really extremely important. Uh, I will introduce Eva now. I'd like to come back later because mm -hmm. I'd like to speak, uh, like you to speak also about the fact of how has COVID really affected, you know, the mm -hmm. visitors, I mean, the, the knowledge, the, the outreach, etc., that you would normally do. But let's go back and wait for it. And I'd like to introduce our second expert uh, in this panel. And I'm very grateful, Eva, that you have decided to join us here. Eva Kovac is the Academic Program Director at the Vienna Wiesenthal Institute for Holocaust Studies. And uh, she uh, has a PhD in Sociology and Economics from the Corvinus University in Budapest got her habilitation uh, about 10 years ago, and she's also the research chair at the Institute of Sociology at the Hungarian Academy of Sciences. And she really is an expert in research also on the history of the Holocaust in Eastern Europe, also on memory and remembrance, which is the topic for today. 
and uh, you edited, I must say, very impressively, nine volumes and numerous articles in period journals, etc. And uh, so um, she is also a founder of an audiovisual archive. We must make also a little plug here for that. And that's called The Voices of the 20th Century in, uh, in Budapest. And again, uh, if I just, uh, you allow me a personal note, is when I was at the United Nations for so many years, at one point I was responsible for uh, the also, which included a large number of people uh, who were in the, in the DHL, the commercial library. And we had an audiovisual archive that we started. And we were trying, I was trying very hard to, re, to raise funds for it because it was not in the regular budget of the UN. But I thought it was so important that we hear the people in their own voices speak about their experiences, what they thought. And I now look to you to uh, bring us uh, home a little bit with also the people you've worked and I know that you've done some very touching and very uh, some videos that you've done with some of the uh, Holocaust survivors uh, particularly also in Hungary. Eva, over to you. So I would also like to thank you for the invitation. It's really a, a big honor for me to be there with you and discuss this uh, uh, absolutely enormous situation around us. Uh, and I also w was happy to hear from Wojtek that uh, uh, the material evidence or physical evidence of, of a crime, in, in our case, the Shoah, is still so important. And I, I, I see the same uh, from the point of view of research, conducting researches. If you, if you just look into the, the forensic uh, um, studies, uh, or just uh, following the, the newest development in, in Holocaust research or research on genocide studies, you will see that the physical evidence uh, of a crime is still extremely important. Don't ask why. I conducted many field work in my, in my uh, uh, past 20 years. And uh, uh, I, 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 I conducted many interviews with locals. And uh, I observe that th this type of evidence we still need, in spite of, uh, of the digital life or the digital turn, uh, we need some physical evidence. But on the other hand, we need the voices of the survivors. And I think it's also another very important point of the story. But first, I would like to say some words about the Institute. So maybe you don't know that this Institute was founded 12 years ago. And we are a, a very, very miniature institute uh, uh, in comparison of, of, of the Auschwitz Memorial. And we have a totally different uh, a task. We, is an, we, we are an institute for advanced studies, uh, which, mean, which means that we have always uh, uh, fellowship programs and uh, um, uh, fellows uh, from, from the world uh, visiting us and conducting researches in the institute using the, the library of the institute and the archive of the institute as well. We have a very, very um, uh, important ar archival collection. Uh, actually, this is the, the uh, uh, founding uh, um, treasure of the institute. This is the personal archive of Simon Wiesenthal, who was, uh, was involved uh, uh, to... to uh, uh, to understand uh, uh, and and establish the knowledge on the Shoah, and uh, f starting from from Auschwitz to the Mauthausen uh, uh, collections. So this is really a huge uh, a huge treasure of the institute, having the, the intact uh, archival material of Simon Wiesenthal, and this is also the guarantee for the institute to to. Uh, yeah, to uh, applying uh, research projects and new research uh, uh, um, e e uh, the, um, ideas on the basis of this of this archive. Uh, I also want to mention that uh, uh, um, COVID made our situation not so not so bad. It really uh, uh, sounds a bit blasphemic. But uh, uh, since we are working in, in a digital world, uh, it, it is still um, uh, 
Yeah, it's it is still possible to to continue uh, the seminars, to continue the smaller workshops and webinars, and also having uh, access uh, access to archives and uh, and uh, and libraries. We still have the possibility to conduct research. On the other hand. Uh, science is not just reading and uh, and writing, but the, uh, a lot of uh, personal exchanges, which we cannot have now, and it's it's really it's really hard. So uh, we have young scholars, junior fellows, uh, who need uh, uh, an enormous support uh, from from the scientific community, which is almost impossible now, because. Uh, uh, in a webinar, yes, you can give some input, but it's not the same than sitting together, uh, having this physical experience, as Wojtek mentioned, in your hand and analyzing it together uh, uh, day by day. It, it, it produces a, uh, another type of knowledge, which now we cannot produce. Uh, and I still hope that we will uh, produce. The second point, which is, which is re really a dramatic situation, now that we have still survivors, and it's really interesting to to um, um, follow to follow the 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 discussions on on the um, position of the survivors in the Holocaust historiography in the past thirty years. It was thirty years ago when the first scholars mentioned that we, uh, slowly we 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 have to uh, change our uh, our or or. or understanding because the, the survivors will, will leave us. And we still have a lot of survivors, relatively, which is, which is, which is, which is a fantastic uh, uh, um, possibility to understand what happened uh, uh, 74, uh, four, four, four years, years ago. On the other hand, they are the more, most, uh, um, uh, they are actually in the most vulnerable situation of COVID, so I cannot visit, I should not visit my, my inter, interview partners in these months or years. Uh, I, I can collect a Skype interview or, or, or a Zoom interview, but it's, it's totally different. And some of them cannot hear in, uh, enough good. So they have also some, some health problems. So I think this is the most important uh, um, uh, lost uh, in the in the research project that we currently cannot uh, conduct an interview. So we we can work with uh, oral history collections which which were produced earlier, but we cannot cannot uh, um, uh, uh, conduct new interviews with 90 plus year old uh, uh, survivors. And last but not least, I would also. I uh, want to mention that uh, uh, the Institute, uh, the Wiesenthal Institute, uh, is a very, now in a, in a very good position, which can also uh, influence, influence the, the discourse on the Holocaust in, in, in Austria and in Europe. Uh, the European Commission supports uh, 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 a research project, uh, the name is a European Holocaust research infrastructure since more than 10 years. And this is the third round. And uh, uh, we are now able to, to build a, a so-called Holocaust research infrastructure on European level, but also on Austrian level. And, and the meaning of this project is to, to make it possible for, 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 for future scholars to use uh, um, uh, research materials Mutual objects, uh, uh, knowledges, etc. Within this research framework, having the best tools to to understand uh, uh, these objects, sources, etc. So I am um, uh, um, as as Wojtek, I am still optimistic because we have just started to do this uh, research uh, infrastructure project, and uh, there are many many new possibilities to to cooperate with with Austrian and 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 uh, and European uh, research institutions to to keep the. Uh, Holocaust uh, memory as uh, as uh, strong as possible, and to produce new new uh, knowledge also in the field of historiography. So this is just 
short the short, a short summer summary what are now what what we are now doing uh, under this covid situation in the institute thank you thank you Eva. that's that's really very important and that's very interesting and again it underlines the value of the oral history oral history visual history you know you basically have to see it and it's hard to imagine it it's hard to only read about it even though you know many scholars and and researchers do that but on the other hand it's extremely powerful if you actually have visual evidence and you have the survivors and it's very sad that because of covid and of their advancing age it is not possible to deepen that research that you're currently doing so let's just everyone hope that this passes over and we can move as as we were able to do before i uh, one of the questions that i have to you because i mean you've clearly done a lot of work on this already um you've you know you've you've, you've established this uh, project also for more than 10 years and my question is also how does this network with other institutes and other entities and institutions that are conducting similar work so that one could see not only part of it like what you're doing but maybe something that is more european worldwide you know what what whatever can you just speak a little bit to that Yes of course uh, because there are many many uh, avenues uh, first and uh, I think the, the most important is to register the sources to register the collections the knowledges and this was the first two rounds of the of the IRI project just uh, to recognize and register um, precarious uh, archival collections in Belarus, in Ukraine, in Moldavia. So it's also important that the uh, Holocaust happened in, in Eastern Europe and uh, the, the knowledge production of uh, the Holocaust is still in the Western part of Europe. And the EU <laughs> has the mission to, co to merge it, so not to, to make it a kind of uh, battlefield, uh, but rather to, to, to use the advantages of these uh, different uh, aspects, that the sources is uh, partly in Eastern Europe and there are many precarious uh, collections there without any descriptions. The first and most important is to recognize these uh, collections to register them to make it accessible and of course it's 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 a huge amount of investment and ERI cannot uh, uh, pay for for scanning etc so it's not a, a such a huge project that you can scan all of the materials around Europe uh, which which are uh, uh, Holocaust relevant uh, uh, materials but recognition is the first or, or yeah recognition and register 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 is the first step because if you know, if you find uh, this in a register, uh, in a registry, then you can go there and you, or you can ask the archivist to, to uh, prepare the material for you and for your research. The second is, um, uh, um, and this is within the framework of digital turn, that uh, uh, historians uh, can and have to work together with non-historians like uh, archivists, uh, digital humanities experts, mathematicians who are able to work with so-called big data, which means that for, I, 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 can, I have a nice example, um, people court trials. People court trials we had in all of Europe after 45 with a huge amount of documentations and we still don't have um, a methodology or research tools how we can understand the European history of of the uh, afterlife of, of of the Holocaust on the basis of the people court trials and now with these research tools we will I hope develop uh, technologies and uh, and uh, research research uh, questions and then technologies which which can be uh, access, uh, uh, applicable to these sources to understand why it happened that way in whole in 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 in, in the whole Europe after forty five. What happened in this in the people court trials? We know, and and the big trials in in Nuremberg trial or in the in the in the Eichmann trial. Yes, we know some of them. We know some unique cases, 
but how we can understand it globally, how we can understand it uh, transnationally. We need technology. So it's not just knowledge. We need a technology who can merge these, these uh, historical sources who can bring in uh, new questions into the discussion and also new methodological tools which we can apply and then we can say something about the, the European discourse on the Shoah after 45. That's, it was just one, one example. We have many other example, uh, examples uh, um, on, on testimonies. So we have more than 100,000 testimonies digitized from USHMM to Mauthausen. Uh, the memorial. How can we deal with it? How can we work with these materials? The inter interviews were conducted in hundred languages. Who is <laughs> who is able to to listen to all of the interviews? How we can pick uh, up uh, the knowledge of this uh, um, huge material? How can we still uh, be ethical? in the meaning of uh, historical research on the Shoah. So what is the ethics and aesthetics using 100,000 of uh, oral history interviews, etc. So this is why these uh, European research uh, uh, um, cooperations can be really important and can be really formative in the pro uh, knowledge production of, of, the, of the Holocaust historiography, because now we can connect Knowledges which are which are there maybe since more than, than than twenty years, but we couldn't connect them to our uh, basic knowledges. And I think this is the main main task of the the European Holocaust Research infra, infra, Infrastructure to develop research tools and and frameworks research frameworks of of collecting material, emerging material, and understanding the, the, the meaning of these materials in the very specific uh, historical event. So I, I am really optimistic because uh, most of so the best of the Holocaust scholars are there and uh, they have a lot of experiences. And this, what I really like in this project, that we need other scholars, not just historians. So it's not an internal dis dis discussion, mm -hmm. but sociologists, ethnographists, mathematicians, uh, computing science experts are also uh, welcome because we cannot, we cannot work uh, without uh, their knowledge. Well, you're, you're presenting the complexity of this effort extremely well because, of course, yes, it is conducted in various languages. You know, it's not only the researchers, but it's also other skill sets that are needed in order to make it operational and accessible. And I think the accessibility is really the, the, the word here that, that, that needs to count. But let's move back to, um, to Wojtek and, and ask him, because I had already previewed my question, because I'd really like to know, because I think it's the outreach and it's, it's also, you know, what happened in COVID. And one thing that struck me very much when you were uh, saying in your opening uh, statement, what I found really important is that you said Poland itself could not take care of all of this. You know, we needed international assistance. And that is something else that we need to think about. How are memorial sites safeguarded and who is responsible for them? But maybe we can speak first about the COVID situation and how it mm -hmm. has influenced mm -hmm. visitors, knowledge, outreach, you know, school groups, whatever, if you would address that. Thank please. you. Yeah, that's, that's indeed very, very important. And uh, I can only stress that COVID has been very harsh with, uh, with the memorial because um, in the past 10 years, there was an annual increase in the number of visitors of around 5 to 7%. So I remember that more or less 10 years ago, there was uh, more than 10, 1 million visitors coming to visit the site annually. And in comparison with that, uh, in 2019, we had more than 2.3 million visitors, which is on the one hand, uh, a very interesting sign, which shows that people find interest with time passing. Interest does not diminish, which is a very good thing, we believe. Um, on the other hand, uh, it also shows that uh, we have to think of, or we had to think about the limitations, the capacity of this uh, cemetery, because it is a symbolic cemetery. It is, uh, Auschwitz-Birkenau is the only uh, former concentration and extermination camp that is UNESCO enlisted. It is a World Heritage Site, pars pro toto for all the other camps. 
And uh, it certainly does not have uh, limitless capacities to host all people who want to come in person. Uh, on the third side, I shall say that uh, certainly the interest in uh, the history of this site and uh, the fate of its victims, but also the stories of the survivors, is uh, far bigger than 2.3 million or even 5 million. Uh, in the recent years, the memorial was very successful in reaching out through modern technologies, mainly social media, to new groups of people, young generations, uh, who don't have the means to visit this uh, you know, medium-sized town in southern Poland. Uh, it's either too far away or it's too, too, uh, too expensive to travel to Poland, but still they find it very, very interesting. And they want to have a share and they want to have more insight and also take responsibility for, for their surroundings and, and their environment. And they find it inspiring to see uh, the lessons we have learned from the Holocaust and uh, the, 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 um, the um, I don't want to use the word inspiration, of course, but somehow how this place since 1945 has contributed to understanding the roots of evil and how we can change what is happening around our uh, around in our neighborhood. And I think that especially now in the last uh, couple of years when we have seen so many uh, um, viol violent acts uh, of hatred based on, t uh, on ethnicity, nationality, religion, places like, like this uh, or the Wiesenthal Institute are extremely important because they are really raising awareness and they, they can really make a difference. And, and that is our ambition. We know from our experience here at the foundation that it is possible to gather international assistance of 39 governments for uh, a cause that was uh, um, perhaps obvious to many, but was not obvious to uh, very specific politicians. When I, when I joined uh, uh, this, this foundation, not as its director general, but as a council member a couple of years ago, it also seemed to me very, um, very logical that whenever you mention Auschwitz-Birkenau has needs, financial needs, you will find people ready to finance whatever you, you, you tell them to, to finance. Now, it's, this is not the reality. You have to explain to people, you have to approach them. And I think that this foundation, uh, with my predecessors and all our supporting partners, was very successful in, in translating and explaining to, to our partners that we have very specific means and that they are of, uh, of, of big significance and that we really can make a difference if we allow those 2.3 million or even 5 million, or I don't know the numbers now in the COVID uh, in the future, uh, if we allow these people to come to the site and, and uh, experience at first hand what, what they want to, to understand. Now, um, you mentioned uh, the, the consequences of COVID and of course the memorial was, uh, has been shut down during the first wave. And now uh, since two weeks also during the second wave, it is a regular cultural institution under Polish law and cultural institutions like so many others had to be closed. Uh, the, the memorial has been given the freedom by the Minister of Culture to open the uh, outside um, um, points of access. So whenever someone wishes to, to, to pay a visit um, outside the buildings, outside the barracks, be it at Auschwitz I or Auschwitz II Birkenau, they are free to do so. Uh, but it is, um, it is very, very difficult. Now, some, um, uh, some ceremonies take place that are paying tribute to specific groups of, uh, of victims, uh, but they are not attended, of course. So uh, out of these 2.3 million, uh, only, uh, I think, around 400,000 arrived this year. So uh, we, we are facing a complete different reality. Mm -hmm. And uh, this also has to do not only with education, not only with awareness raising, but everyone understands that although Auschwitz-Birkenau is accessible freely, because as I said, it is a symbolic cemetery and no one is uh, charging an access fee, people are leaving money and they are donating whenever they come and they find it is a, a good cause. Now, with, with people not arriving, uh, the memorial doesn't have the funds to cover its um, basic operational costs. Uh, the foundation is able to secure the preservation, but all the other operations like education, like uh, research, uh, even security, all the other, without any exception, operations are under extreme risk and stress. And uh, the, the, the government, of course, is providing funds, but uh, like in so many other cases, uh, funds are insufficient. So. Um, right now, the museum is closed and uh, 
they probably would have the opportunity to open and to make it more accessible, but uh, without a, a certain number of visitors per day, it's just not financially feasible. So they decided to, to shut down and limit the, the, the losses. So um, COVID is, uh, is a, a, a very, very, uh, is posing a very concrete risk to, to the ordinary operations of the memorial. Yeah, well, so we can only hope it's going to be over soon. Yeah. I want to ask one more question, um, and it prompts me because you didn't want to use the word inspiration, yeah. but I want to come back to the word inspiration. I want to ask Eva a question because um, you have worked very closely with concentration camp survivors, and there are also some videos that you have shared, and there was one very striking, particularly striking woman called Eva Fahidi, and she speaks about her experiences uh, but she does not wish to succumb to hate. And she says, hate engenders hate, and I do not want to soil my mind with such emotions. I mean, this really touched me very deeply. It is such a, such a wonderful kind of forgiveness emotion. I don't even know how to call it. I mean, maybe you can share a little bit about your work with her or some other survivors you have worked with. Oh, yes, yes. I'm really happy to tell this story. I cannot tell this story in details, but Eva Fahidi was uh, uh, 95 a week ago. Uh, and uh, she's, she, she, she's a Holocaust survivor from Auschwitz, uh, now, and um, uh, she, 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 had, she has a very, very long life behind her. And it's just 10 years ago that she started to tell the, her experiences during the Shoah, uh, and uh, 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 a choreographer uh, was there in th that evening. It was a very small uh, event in Budapest, and this choreographer had the idea, okay, let's do something with this story, and then asked Eva Fahidi, who, who was a, an amateur dance dancer, whether she would be able to, to do something together. Uh, with a with a young dancer, and Eva told, "Yes, why don't yes, just ask, yes, yes, let's do it." And it was it was amazing because she she started to dance, yeah, seven or eight years ago, and it became a, an extremely successful, um, famous uh, dance performance, and this is a a, a unique one. I, I just wanted to find uh, another one with the same um, um, uh, conditions, but I, I haven't found yet uh, because she was uh, yeah, almost 90 when she, when she started this, uh, this uh, theater performance. Uh, and it's a kind of dialogue between two women and the, and the, and the, ta uh, yeah, the, the, the goal of this, this dialogue is to understand each other. So it's not a, a, a classical storytelling of the Holocaust or a biographical account or on the on the on the Shoah or, or on the on the personal experiences. Of course, of course, she she tells a lot about her experiences, but in the framework of a dialogue and, and the, the partner of Eva is 30 years old. And it's really a kind of, so it's a kind of tra, a tra, inter, intergenerational dialogue in the language of the dance. And it, it, it's amazing, it, it really works excellent. And uh, the, the, the theater performance was extremely successful. Then the, the choreographer uh, pro produced a, a, a documentary on the story, and it was the first film of the choreographer, and the film, film is extremely successful. So the, the film had, in the past two years, uh, five, international prizes, uh, so won uh, five international prizes. And uh, the film is also this dialogue. So it's it, 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 it really a, a, a special pos a position of, of being in a dialogue, not conducting an interview. Because conducting an interview is also a special speech act. You are there, you are listening, and you are not a, a very active uh, part of the, of the discussion. Having this dance performance or the film uh, and this is really the the art of the story how you can work with testimony how you can how you can make testimony lively again because as i mentioned we have hundred thousand 
testimonies. Can you do something with hundred thousands of testimonies? It's not it's not easy. But if you can bring the the story into a dialogue, then it starts to work. And uh, and yeah, this is the, the beautiful um, moment of the story and the very sad moment that Eva wanted to dance this year as well. And it was not her capacity which made made it impossible. It was the COVID which mm-hmm. made it impossible. And if you think about it, okay, he is now nine, 95, and you wish 20 years for her, but still you have the feeling whether he, she will be able to dance a year ago, a year later, after, after COVID. So how we can keep this knowledge, how we can keep this, this unique um, experience for the post-COVID times. And this is my uh, really sad uh, moment in, the, in COVID, that I, I wonder whether we can go back to our survivors a year later. Uh, I, I followed many, many uh, very, very tra- uh, tra- tragic uh, uh, news in the past uh, couple of months. And yes, now we are losing uh, okay. the last of the survivors. Yeah, well, well, thank you, Eva. I think this was a, an unusual testimony, as you said, but it was a very touching and a very moving one when, when I watched it. And I just hope more people have the chance to see this example. I have one last question to both of you before I open it up to the questions. There already some have come in. Um, and that is, both of your institutions were established about 10 years ago. I think it was 2009. And and uh, I think the Institute, the Institute, the Institute, the Institute, Institute the same I mean, why, why so late? I, you know, it seems to me that this, you know, could have been, should have been done earlier or, or how, how did this come about? Maybe Wojtek, I can ask you first. Yeah, sure, sure. Well, as I said, time is, is a factor and time is working against us. And uh, I think that uh, also in the 90s, uh, Holocaust denial was a central issue. Uh, with all people dealing with uh, with places of of terror, this was the central point. With you know people with influence who who were claiming uh, that the gas chambers and crematoria of Auschwitz did, did not exist in reality. So this was one of the of the central, if not the central issue. Uh, as uh, as soon as it was possible to to confront these people and to prove the greater public that they were wrong and that they were liars, and courts stepped in. Um, the focus was turned into the material witnesses and uh, with uh, more and more survivors fading away and their voices becoming weaker, um, the, 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 the experts uh, focused on, on material witnesses and uh, they understood that um, uh, with time passing, uh, I can give you a very specific example, those 45 brick barracks we are looking at at Birkenau uh, some 15 years ago, I think four, maximum five, were not accessible to visitors because of security reasons. They were in bad shape. Uh, they had to be preserved. They had to be repaired. Uh, nowadays, the, this, uh, this uh, and, and 40 were open. So any visitor could you know, walk into, as soon as they arrived, they could walk into and experience how, how they looked. Now this tendency is reversed. 45, 40 are closed and only a couple are open. And uh, including those two I mentioned that had been preserved and opened and given back to the public last year. Um, so this, this is, a, uh, I think, two, two important uh, and, and decisive moments that were, when we turned our attention to, to the material witnesses and uh, we were also instructed in a very good way by survivors who said, listen, one day we will not be there. And Bartoszewski was very open and not only him, Marian Turski and, and many, many others. And they were saying, one day we will not be here and you have to, if you really care about our testimony, if you really care about our life experience until 45 and what we have done uh, afterwards with building bridges between Poland and Germany, Poland, Israel, and so on, uh, then please do look into taking care of, of those uh, material witnesses. And, and that's, that, that's why the, the, the mission of the foundation came about. And while, while I'm, I'm thinking about time, you know, time is... Of course, a risk factor because um, it works against us, but it also comes very often with surprises. And I can tell you that uh, in the process of preserving these two brick barracks at Birkenau, that was a process which lasted for 
four years approximately. It was initially intended, planned for two years. And uh, during the process, it turned out that it's not possible to finish it in such a short time. Uh, the reason for that miscalculation was also because we did not have any experience whatsoever. No one was doing such a large universal preservation project on these buildings before. There were only reactive measures taking place when it comes to preservation. You know, when, whenever there was a hole in the roof, it was, it was being covered so it, the rain doesn't do larger damage. We didn't have the expertise, we didn't have the know-how, and we didn't have the financial means, but the situation was not as severe as it is right now. And these past 10 years have shown us that we are able to gather large amounts of experience, know-how. And uh, you mentioned the international cooperation with, with other institutes and, and the Wiesenthal Institute. I think it is really time now and the memorial is ready to start sharing what they were able to, to amass in terms of uh, experience. And I think this is really valuable because it's, it is 20th century history they're working with. And there is not many centers around the world which have experience in preserving brickstone. And, uh, you know, it is not a Baroque church that they are working with. You can't uh, disassemble this building, take care of individual brickstone, and then reassemble it. That is simply not possible because we will not be looking at an, uh, uh, at an authentic uh, structure afterwards. So they have to apply very innovative means. And to, to be very specific, let me tell you one story. Uh, during the, the process of preserving these two brick barracks, it turned out that some of the walls were moving to, to the sides and they were, they are, they were running risk of, of breaking down, breaking together. And uh, now it's not possible to take off the roof, straighten the walls and then put the roof back on top. So they had to come up with an idea and they did so with a technical university from Silesia, which was extremely helpful. They constructed a par parallel construction to these walls that were leaning outside, loop-sided, so to speak a parallel construction, and in between this parallel metal construction and the original wall, they have squeezed in, I think, around 40 car jacks, authentic car jacks, these tools you use to raise a car whenever you have a flat tire. And, and then everything was, of course, electronically monitored. They were very slowly uh, raising these, these car jacks and, and minimizing the, the, the space difference between this artificial wall and the original wall and thus straightening the original wall very slowly very very slowly actually that was a process which took a very long time and only after reaching a perfect uh, vertical level of the original wall they had to insert metal wires into the original wall and then straighten it and fix it so it doesn't go outside or inside again and this has not been done anywhere else as far as i know and as far as as these experts who are excellent, uh, no, but they have to uh, try very often. And, and for this specific purpose, they used brickstone from, uh, from that area. They, they bought some original brickstone from the 30s and 40s. They had constructed a small wall. They made it uh, tend to one side, and then they had to, to try to work with it uh, um, theoretically, so to speak, practically, but, but not with the original construction. So they don't run risk and, and destroy something that is of, of such great value. Now, another example, and, and this will be the last, I promise, of, of time working in favor is also that during the process of the preservation of these two buildings, the uh, conservators were able to excavate almost 1,000 personal items from the earth. Because when they started uh, excavating the uh, foundations of the buildings, uh, and the, the internal floors, it turned out that many objects have either fallen to the floor during the times of the operation of the camp, or some of them were hidden by prisoners because it was not allowed to have jewelry or items like pocket knives. There is a very um, famous example of a pocket knife which was hidden under one of the panels of the interior of, these, uh, of one of these brick barracks. And once the, uh, the preservation team took off these panels. These are very thin panels that were used for isolation purposes. They didn't really serve the purpose because it was not intended to give warmth to the prisoners, of course, but they were, so to speak, isolation um, panels. And once it was taken off, a pocket knife, a Swiss pocket knife, fell from, from, from there uh, onto the floor. And uh, we can only guess that it used to belong to one of the prisoners. We don't know whom it belonged to, but we can, um, you know, every 
such a story and every personal item tells a story and we can try to connect to, to the tragic history of, of the people who, who, who spent the last days in these buildings. And if you, found, if you find a thousand objects and all of them have to be taken care of, that shows you also the, uh, the mass of work that needs to be done um, and that, that needs, to be, to, needs to be considered. So. Well, thank you, Wojtek, for sharing. These are fascinating details that uh, none of us would really know. And as you had mentioned in the beginning, that these uh, brick barracks, of course, were not built for the duration. They were built as temporary structures. But the painstaking work of preserving it authentically uh, is, really, is really quite amazing when one thinks about that you need people who have specific solutions for these buildings to straighten the walls because they are you know, bulging out. Yeah. I mean, this is, this is really quite a f amazing, uh, quite an amazing s uh, story. And I think that you were right about the uh, establishment and the timing of the establishment. And I don't know, Eva, if that was true in terms of the Institute <clears throat> as well. Absolutely. And uh, I, I don't want to be blaspheme, but we are, we are also working a lot uh, uh, of preservation uh, uh, if uh, the meaning of uh, preservation of documents, uh, uh, um, digi digi di digitizing them, conserve, conser conservation uh, processes, working with voices in with dig digital te uh, technologies, it, 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 it's it's really big big tasks also for us. And and um, yes, uh, sometimes it it it's also seems to be as a as a rather technical thing. But I have to say that it cannot work that way. As Wojtek mentioned, this, uh, this, this knee. I have another uh, example. I worked with, uh, with um, um, a, a sub-collection of the, of the Jewish community uh, uh, in, in Vienna. And this was a collection of, of, uh, of uh, bills, different bills were, were um, uh, um, were collected by the so-called uh, Jewish Judenrat, also the Ältestenrat. Uh, they were these um, 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 special office uh, uh, in the in the last year of the of uh, World War II. Um, 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 Jewish representatives were, were rep responsible for the, the Hungarian Jewish forced laborers in, in Vienna, and I just I just I I, I was working with 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 these uh, with these bills, and it was uh, rather a technical thing, and then suddenly I found the receipt of a of a Hungarian doctor uh, with the with the address of the Hungarian small town in this collection. And then I started to reconstruct what happened, why this piece of paper uh, of a doctor of Hungary is there in the, in the collections of the bills, the Nazi source, I have to say. And then I understand that it was a doctor, as a forced laborer, who was responsible for forced labor, for slave labor, but he still had the identity of a doctor. And... This, this block of this block of papers, the block of notice uh, uh, papers, were still there with him, and he wanted to help for a for a sick, for another sick forced laborers, and he wrote on this paper what would be the best medicament for this other guy, for this other slave laborer. And it was it was shocking. So I cannot tell you the how I felt myself because I was prepared to work with these Nazi uh, sources, the bills, and and I was totally uh, uh, so conceptualized to work with these for sources and understand the the economic history of everyday life in slave labor, and then suddenly another world opened. And I was there. I was there again in this small city in Hungary. And I wondered how this doctor could keep this piece of paper and why. They, they, they had, he, had, he had to know that he will be deported. He had to know that this is, uh, this is just five kilograms which he can take to this uh, uh, trip to Strasshof. But he still had the identity and the mission, the roof, as uh, Germans uh, says, uh, the call as a doctor. Mm -hmm. 
who has to help. And this is, I, I think, well, the same with, the, with your example, Wojtek, that you are there, you want to understand the technology of the preservation, and suddenly an object appears, and then the, the, bigger, the biggest question of, of uh, the et biggest ethical question of Holocaust uh, research uh, uh, became absolute visible again. So this is this is the this is the complexity of of our work, I think. Mm -hmm. Well, it's the complexity, Eva, but it's also you're making it sound extremely interesting in terms of you know you discover new things. I mean, you basically come across unexpected uh, um, issues or unexpected findings that rather overwhelm you because you know they, you didn't expect them. I find that really, really, really very. Very overwhelming. I wanted to go now to the um, Q and A's, and uh, let me. I have to. I have to read it. It's kind of a longish question, but let me read it. <clears throat> but uh, the uh, this participant really liked the one interesting insights. But <clears throat> with the passing and the contemporary witnesses becoming less, how does Auschwitz Memorial try to preserve this important personal experience, uh, including the diversity of the victims in its work? And also from a perspective from within Poland to show the whole perspective of the whole Shoah, including the memories and knowledge of the perpetrators, which is also disappearing from the different countries. I think, uh, Wojtek, I'll go first to you. Okay. Well, that's a, that's a very, very interesting and very timely question, of course. And when it comes to um, securing voices, because this is also an issue we, we have been talking uh, today about um, a couple of times. Um, COVID has also made us um, think about how we should prepare for the future and for a world after COVID-19 and hopefully the vaccine, the vaccine will be here soon and we will be able to resume our work and, and have as many people as possible and, and serve them with, uh, with the information they are seeking. So uh, the memorial and the foundation are looking into uh, ways to work with educational challenges in the future. I, I was mentioning in the beginning that we are looking at uh, securing the preservation uh, process financially and the whole preservation uh, effort will last for another 25 years. This is a, a period we have, um, we have uh, inscribed in the so-called master plan for preservation, which includes all objects and all infrastructure items uh, at Auschwitz-Birkenau. But of course, after these 25 years, the work will have to be repeated. We hope that it will not be such a big uh, challenge because uh, once we have completed, the objects will be in a better shape, but still it will have to come back and, and over and over again. Um, but working with, uh, with, with voices and working with testimonies is particularly under COVID-19 a very interesting issue because uh, we looked at this from the uh, modern technologies perspective and uh, I can tell you that um, both the memorial and the foundation are trying to develop tools that will make, uh, first of all, um, the memorial accessible irrespective of the conditions we are under. So we are trying to prepare for a world that will perhaps once again, somewhere in the future, be like it is today, namely that people will not be able to access the memorial. And uh, during the first wave of Corona, um, we received some not angry but concerned voices from people from all over the world saying that a place like Auschwitz should never be closed for the public. These people have a right to say so and uh, we of course understand their emotions. It comes very often from uh, survivors or second, third generation survivors and their families and uh, it is perfectly understandable that, uh, that they, uh, they, they make these concerns and, and, and publish them. Uh, so we are trying to make sure in the future that Auschwitz-Birkenau will remain accessible no matter what, what. And this can be hopefully done through modern technologies, through uh, uh, apps and uh, the internet, of course. This will never replace the authentic experience. But uh, through these technologies, we also hope to make the, uh, uh, the memorial accessible to more people than only physically. Uh, perhaps it will allow us to, uh, to have guided tours, to have educators work on the site with not 2.3 million, but 50 million, who knows? I think that is, uh, it is in our reach and we will, we will be working with, uh, with some companies on this in the, coming, in the coming months. This has also to do with the fact that we would like to increase the accessibility of uh, testimonials like Eva said, which is incredibly important and, and perhaps we could work on this in the future together. 
because the memorial also has very rich archives and it has testimonies of uh, survivors. And it also has something else which is also very important, namely the fact that uh, educators and guides, and you have to understand that there are 400 of these working for the Auschwitz Memorial. These are not employees of the memorial, they are outside contractors. Uh, so their situation right now is even more difficult than this than the situation of the employees of the memorial because they depend on the work which they can't um, fulfill right now because no one is there. Um, but these educators uh, are telling more and more that it's becoming a bigger challenge to explain to specifically young generations those most symbolic moments or places at Auschwitz-Birkenau. For example, the the ramp or um, the entrance to the uh, gas chambers and crematoria, or the, the meaning, the symbolic meaning of the gate, Arbeit macht frei, what it meant to prisoners to walk under this gate every day, what it meant to them to see their families being separated on the, on the so-called Judenrampe. Uh, these are th things that the educators uh, are uh, very, very um, um, focused on, when they look at the reactions of visitors who arrive. And they are telling us, especially for young people, it is very difficult to understand the true meaning. These experiences are very painful. Most people react in their very own ways, and it is very difficult for almost everyone. But uh, we have to look for ways to explain and translate somehow the emotions that were, that were there for, 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 um, for, for, for prisoners. And there is a way to enhance the usage of testimonies uh, for visitors who come in person and visit the place. It's, of course, not a topic for us at all to replace, you know, to, uh, to give to visitors um, mobile applications and let them walk through the camp for three hours with their mobile phones and looking into the screen. That's, that's not the idea. But it is a possibility to make it more accessible and better understandable if they have, for example, the chance to select five spots in both Auschwitz I and Auschwitz II Birkenau very symbolic spots and let survivors speak to them what it meant to them to enter the, uh, the gas chamber, for example, and why they survived and what it meant for them to survive, to see water coming out of the showers and not, uh, not uh, Cyclone B. So this is something we are thinking of and, and, and working on right now. I, I can't give you too, too many details, unfortunately, right now, but I, I am very hopeful and very optimistic that this will... Uh, uh, give greater access and security access in, in possible times of crisis in the future. Thank you, Wojciech. I mean, very, very true, all of it. Um, and um, now turning over to Eva, would you like to add? I, I'm really happy to cooperate with Wojtek in the in the <laughs> near future. Uh, uh, and you. You, you are absolutely right. Uh, this is also a question, so gen question of generations. And I also observe that uh, the younger generations are more open uh, to use uh, uh, high-tech uh, uh, solutions to understand history. Uh, and sometimes it also reach my uh, limit. Uh, the, the most successful, um, uh, um, yeah, the most successful is uh, uh, the so-called hologram, hologram survivor of, uh, of the Shoah Foundation, uh, the Spielberg Collection. Uh, uh, probably you know uh, Mr. Pinkas is the the uh, uh, person who who gave a testimony and then it was uh, established as a hologram and uh, and uh, in in, cer in certain educational um, occasions uh, children can come and ask questions from this hologram uh, Mr. Pinkas and uh, and Mr. Pinkas is a, is a lively holo hologram and uh, he answers this question questions and I think it's really a kind of limit of our understanding on the other hand it works excellent with these younger uh, generations so I wonder whether we should learn again or re-establish again our ethical position uh, with, uh, with, with the working with testimonies because the technology is amazing so this is the uh, artificial intelligence story so you can ask something for uh, non-existing three-dimensional hologram, which is uh, exactly the same as a, as a real person. On the other hand, uh, 
as I mentioned, these 100,000 uh, collected testimonies uh, make, make us uh, possible to research them. And it's also a question of uh, inventions, how you can work with such a huge amount of testimonies, what type of questions can you, can you um, um, uh, form to this uh, collection. And we have really good experiences, like the, the best uh, example is Christopher Browning, uh, who, who wrote, wrote a book 10 years ago uh, uh, on Starahovica, on, on the camp of Starahovica. And, and he uh, worked more than 300 or 400 testimonies and could tell the story of the everyday life in the Starahovica camp. Uh, so, in, so, so it was a, a, such a book that you cannot leave. So it was, it was really a, a, a scientific, a scholarly publication, but it was written in a way that you could understand, you could see, you can listen, and you, can, you could understand what happened in the concentration camp. So I think uh, sur uh, survivor testimonies and, uh, and interviews are still uh, very important sources for, for inventing new knowledge on, on Holocaust historiography. And on the other hand, as, as, as Wojtek mentioned, it's really an, uh, um, an amazing source for education. We organized a couple of guided tours in the city of Vienna, and the basic uh, um, source of these, these tours were, the uh, commemoration tours were um, uh, survivor testimonies. And, uh, and yes, the, 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 the guests, uh, the visitors, the, the participants of these tours uh, could imagine this, uh, um, um, yeah, this uh, cognitive, cognitive uh, place of, of, uh, of the past with the help of, 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 the, of the survivor's text testimony, I think better than in other, with, other, with other historical uh, sources. So I think the, 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 the testimonies have its own, that their own future. We are, we are responsible to, fry, to find the, the ethical way to use it. Thank you very much, Eva. I find it very interesting about the hologram and using artificial intelligence to answer questions. Uh, I think that probably there are very different opinions on this, and it may also be a generational question, <laughs> where like the older generation, uh, to which I certainly am part of, uh, looks at this a little bit askance and would rather have the authentic, but then the younger generation, which sees this as something that could be um, rather interesting because it immediately responds to, to their questions. But I wanted to, to come back um, to the issue of education because education really is so important these days. And um, that also comes back to a question we've received in the, in the chat. So it's educating, but are you only addressing those who are convinced? I mean, we talked about the 90s, so you both mentioned the 90s when it was a very different situation. But are you also trying... Uh, or to reach and to educate the doubters and the deniers. Is anyone volunteering or do I have to call on you? Wojtek, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, let me call on you. Gladly and try to answer you, yeah, of course. So um, the, currently, um, and this is an opportunity we have been given by, by COVID-19 because we have more time to focus on the really important things. So. Um, right now, we are also trying to look at education challenges from a strategic point of view and think together with the memorial what should be done and changed to reach out to groups, specific groups, multipliers, for example, in the future to uh, make sure that we reach those who are not convinced and that we reach uh, larger groups of people, not only with the historical facts, but also with, uh, with the opportunities to um, make parallels to present days, present times, uh, and that we try to um, talk and work with people uh, about uh, what is happening in their neighborhoods and what it means to be discriminated against on various bases and that uh, Auschwitz should be a warning. And that is a very, very, very practical approach and, and one that is, uh, I should say, simple in Auschwitz because uh, we have been told by Marian Turski, a survivor, uh, during this year's um, ceremony, uh, the, uh, the anniversary um, commemoration, uh, he said in his speech uh, 
uh, on the stage that uh, he called back the memories from Berlin from the 1930s when uh, there were very precisely um, scheduled moments when uh, certain rights of the Berlin Jews were taken away from them, civil rights. So in the first place, they were not allowed to sit on banks in public parks, then their right to swim in public baths was limited, then they were not allowed to sing in, in choirs, in public choirs. And uh, he was explaining this from a very interesting point. He namely said that um, in the beginning, you can say, well, that's not such a big problem for anyone because there was lots of other um, benches in, in, in other districts which stand on private ground. You can also go to private swimming pools and uh, you can also organize your own being a Jew, you can also organize your own choir and can sing your own songs. And, uh, but at a moment, at a certain moment, the victims and the bystanders and, uh, of course, the perpetrators see themselves in a completely different reality, in one where the victims are excluded from our society. And this comes, of course, at a uh, salami tactic, uh, which... Uh, is not being witnessed right now to this extent, but we see early warnings of these policies. And uh, uh, his statement was very clear, and I think it should be understood as a warning. Uh, luckily, there were over 50 representatives of states and governments, and uh, I hope that, uh, that all of them felt uh, that the address was towards them and, uh, and their societies, and that we should do all we can to, to address these, uh, these risks. So um, Auschwitz-Birkenau is, is uh, also a very symbolic place because it allows you to, to do important things. And I like to think of my job as, as being important. Uh, but it also allows you to try to change the reality we are living in. And if you have a warning cry uh, from Auschwitz where almost 1,100,000 people have been slaughtered, uh, it is not very complicated to translate this to the imagination of people who visit and, and find it interesting, either through Twitter, Facebook, or if they decide to come in person because they decide to visit Krakow, which is, you know, an hour drive away from, from Oświęcim, and perhaps they, they don't plan in the first place when they decide to come to Krakow, but uh, as soon as they find themselves in this uh, beautiful southern city of Poland, they, uh, they make the decision and go there, and I think it is life-changing. Um, I, I, don't, I don't think it's life-changing for a group of 20 people coming from any country, but if we manage to um, morally threaten at least one of, out of these 20, we as humanity are on the, on the, on the side of, of winners. And, and that is something that is very encouraging, I think, and that makes this work significant and, and, um, and very, um, very optimistic. It, uh, it tunes us very optimistically. Um, but... Um, we also think that uh, more has to be done than to work with schools only. They have their curricula and Holocaust studies and Holocaust uh, curricula are also among the programs of so many countries. I think this is also one of the reasons why we decided to go towards um, uh, preservation because in the 90s, this was one of the challenges. Nowadays, most students at least have theoretically the opportunity to learn about the Holocaust in their schools. Um, but more has to be done outside of the school curriculum. And we have to find ways to reach uh, police force, the military, clergy. Um, the memorial has a very interesting program uh, in working with um, um, inmates from prisons. And they have, uh, they, have, they have been visited by, I think, 17 or 18,000 inmates from various prisons from across Poland with whom they deal with uh, the idea of, you know, limited freedom and also the responsibility for one's acts and uh, violence and uh, inflicting violence and using violent, violence against other human beings. So these are very specific groups that, that have been to some extent addressed and will be in the future to a larger extent. And I'm, I'm hopeful that the foundation will, will work with the memorial on, on strategically developing these, uh, these groups. Thank you very much, Wojtek. And I think that basically education is so important to also counteract hatred and uh, religious intolerance in the world today. I mean, that's really what we need. 
Uh, so, um, Eva, if you don't mind, I'm going to skip you over right now and because I want to touch, we are running out of time, and I want to touch on one aspect which I find absolutely fascinating because it's the first effort that I've seen to this um, uh, to this extent, and I had drawn this earlier to your uh, attention, but about 10 days ago, uh, there was a report that came out that was really very meaningful, and this was by a French woman called Agnès Kayama. And incidentally, she was just named to be the next executive director of Amnesty International, I found out just two days ago. But she is currently the UN Special Rapporteur on Extrajudicial Summary or Arbitrary Executions. Uh, her name has become a lot more known because she was also responsible for a report on Jamal Khashoggi, but that has nothing to do with our topic here today. But she issued a report which focuses on mass graves and she called them spaces of infinite sorrow. I think it's a wonderful expression, spaces of infinite sorrow. And it, re it really highlights the uh, multitude of sites of mass killings, unlawful deaths, etc. And what she, what she calls for, uh, and this is not only, this is the situation, but she also calls for support, much greater support to countries and communities where these sites are located, because she said it's really important that they're treated with respect, and in accordance with human rights standards. And she also calls, and again, this is like a call for action for a human rights framework that would strengthen the respectful and lawful handling of, of mass graves. I thought it was a really important report. I'm very happy that it's out there in the, in, the, in, the, in the international community. And I just wondered, you know, what your reaction to that was. And maybe I can turn to you first, Eva, and maybe we can conclude with consideration of this report. I think it's it's uh, it also reflect reflects uh, to the first round of our discussion on on physical evidence of a crime, and I think it's it's yes, the infinite sorrow is extremely extremely painful and important and uh, slowly out of history. So if you see what what happened, what is happening now in the former Yugoslavia, um, in Srebrenica. Uh, still mass graves are were not open, still uh, uh, family members are searching for, for dead uh, bodies, then it's, it's all, all contemporary history. It's not a history anymore, a mass grave. It's, it's, a, it's a kind of contemporary sorrow. And on the other hand, I think... Uh, because of media, because of our digital world, we are so intensively uh, implicated in many uh, crimes uh, every day, every hour, every second. And I think it's, it's scholarly also uh, uh, an, an amazing task to understand our position in the current uh, uh, world um, politics. And on the other hand, find this implicated position as a, as a source of being a, 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 a citizen, an active citizen who can develop a kind of politics against, as you mentioned, crimes against humanity, human, the, the position in the human rights discourse, etc. So I think it's, it's, it's an absolutely important question now how we can deal with the, the everyday crimes uh, which had some similarities with the Holocaust and uh, how we can apply these knowledges into the contemporary situation and activate ourselves as active citizens and not, not just uh, uh, feeling ourselves extremely, extremely bad because of, uh, of our uh, uncapacity. So, and, and because we are unable to do something against it. So I think it's, it's a very important topic now. We have a lot of discussions in the past few months with the fellows. We had a very intensive discussion about the re, uh, redefining of, uh, of the position of a perpetrator, a position of a denier, a position of a, um, an implicated subject, how we can uh, understand these positions, how we can understand our current current uh, situation as a as a as a as an ordinary citizen uh, in these 
came. So I think it's, it's a, thank you for the question because I think it's extremely important because we are living in a mass grave or on a mass grave, on a, in symbolically. Every day we see a, a new mass grave in the, in the TV. But I think this is the first time that I've seen that someone uh, actually proposes a framework and also proposes certain standards to be implemented. And I wonder if that could be used leveraged. Uh, that could be used to leverage also to uh, raise additional support, for example, for 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 this. Wojtek, maybe I can turn yeah, I to think you. This is, I mean, this your is, particular case of Auschwitz. This is extremely out. helpful, and and I'm really really glad that you mentioned this report because it it. It points the attention to something that is central in Auschwitz-Birkenau. It is a mass grave. And uh, we always have to remember that uh, approximately 1.1 million people have been murdered there, which, uh, which means that we're talking about Jews, we're talking about Poles, Soviet POWs, and so many Roma and Sinti, and so many other nationalities that, uh, that have been killed there. Uh, but there is also a factor which we have to keep in mind, namely that these 1.1 million is, not, is, is, is a number we can't even imagine. It's, it's the population of half of Warsaw, for example. So it's a number I can't think of in practical terms. And uh, we always try to remember that these are 1.1 million individual stories and 1.1 million individual lives. And of course, the purpose of uh, Hitler's and his followers' plan was to wipe out the history of the Jews of Europe. That was very simple, right? We bring these people to these terrible places. We take away their personal belongings. The very little they were allowed to bring with them, their suitcases, their photos, their documents, birth certificates. We take them away. We uh, inspect them. What can be found useful is transported back to the Third Reich as you know, war aid. And uh, even the gold from, from the teeth of victims is being torn out and goes to the Reichsbank. Uh, the bodies are gassed and burned in the crematoria. And in the end, nothing remains. And that was supposed to be the plan of Hitler and his followers. And now if you look at this from our perspective, 2020, why we, we are doing what we are doing at this site of this terrible mass grave is because if we don't do something, if we don't take up this responsibility and everyone can do something, then we are in some way contributing to his plan because we are not countering the consequences of his actions, because we are saving every individual item. That is why it is so important for us to take care of this toothbrush and these glasses and spoons and knives. Every item matters and every item counts because they are witnesses. And this is uh, a very practical and in fact simple way to contribute to countering the legacy of, the, of this terrible regime and this madman who was trying to wipe out, wipe out the history of, of the Jews of Europe. and. Um, to talk and think about this as a mass grave and try to translate this into ways of, uh, of countering these actions and remembering and honoring the victims is extremely, uh, extremely helpful. And, and uh, I, I would like to reach out to, to, to the author and, and perhaps uh, try to think of ways how we could cooperate and, and develop these ideas. Thank you very much, Wojciech. I think um, this is uh, coming, bringing us back to the topic of remembrance that we started with, but also I think we've had a bit of a historical excursion, but also bringing us back to real day, to the reality of where are we now mm -hmm. and how we actually deal with this. I mean, I thought it was a fascinating discussion that we had. I do want to thank both of you, both Eva, thank both you. Wojtek, for making yourselves available and sharing your insights and sharing your experiences also with a larger um, audience, we will of course put this on um, on our website for later viewing if, if people want to want to have a look at it. So um, let me uh, conclude here. Let me thank both of you extremely heartily to sort of say thank you very much for being here and sharing your experiences. And I do hope that the good work and the excellent work that you're doing will continue without being further impeded by COVID or other ones, particularly as survivors are still alive, those of us who are still with us. So thank you very much and good night. Thank and thank you to all thank participants and uh, to my, the team at the International Institute for yeah, Peace thank for you. Thank you also helping organizing that. So thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye.